Welcome to a conversation engaging today's top thought leaders in the world of business, including marketing, branding, social media, public relations, advertising, and writing in today's uh, digital space. I'm your host, Randy Bowden. Remember, if you have any questions of the guest, please post them on this events page, or you can tweet them using the hashtag marketer marketer, and we'll see if we can answer them. I'm pleased to announce tonight's guest, Mark Schaefer, is one of the most acclaimed and accomplished uh, marketing consultants in the nation. With a special emphasis in social media marketing, Mark has over 30 years of global sales and marketing experience. With two advanced degrees in business and in applied behavioral science, he is a globally sought and recognized uh, business writer university lecturer and innovator, receiving seven international patents for new product ideas with Fortune 100 companies. He is a marketing faculty member at Rutgers University and has been a keynote speaker at major conferences around the world. Mark is the author of the best-selling books, The Tao of Twitter, Born to Blog, and Return on Influence. Mark is uh, the purveyor of the popular Grow blog, as well as his uh, newest endeavor, the Marketing Companion podcast. Mark lives lakeside in the uh, mountain air of Knoxville, Tennessee. Mark, <laughs> welcome. Boy, I, I feel like I should be accepting the Nobel Prize or something. That's the first time I've ever been described as a purveyor. I like that. <laughs> purveyor. Purveyor. I like that. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I'm very honored to have you here, Mark. It's uh, it's it's a pleasure. Uh, you and you need, I have been... you need you need to aim higher. Well, <laughs> well, I'm uh, just being uh, honest. You know, I'm, 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 I'm aiming higher, but I'm taking it one <laughs> step at a time. Once I knock you off, I'm going even higher. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. I'm yeah, just, I might, I might, I might, I'll knock you uh, off and then I'll step up to okay. Mr. Webster. I'll talk to uh, okay. Tom in that. I'm, I'm a stepping stone in Randy Bowden's career. I'm happy to do that. <laughs> well, I do appreciate it, Mark. I wanna, I wanna tell you something. I, in my, um, in my minor engagement online and my following, I've had people ask me once, uh, a few times, actually, a few times, because I have quoted. The first book you wrote, the Tao of Twitter, that got so much uh, so much publicity and 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 what rightly deserved. But I've been asked a few times, man, is there is there some book on Facebook written like the Tao of Twitter? Can I find that? You know, and I always draw a blank. So I'd like you to just because of that because of that book, just the 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 opening of just tell us what is the Tao of Twitter. Yeah, it, it's funny you would you would talk about that because uh, the my publisher McGraw Hill actually wanted me to do a series of books like the Tao of Twitter. Uh, that that book has been a sensation. It's 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 just been so humbling to to see how many people have loved it and embraced it. But the the problem with Facebook is that it's so. It's so vast and it's changing so rapidly. I, I don't think I could be fair to my readers and, and create a book. So, so I turned it down. They, they wanted me to do uh, a whole series. And then um, when Stanford Smith and I started comparing notes about blogging and our, our ideas, and he had the idea of maybe writing a book, and I was thinking, I said, you know what? What if we wrote a book together that was very Tao-like, that was small, accessible, human, not geeky, techy, but something that's fun to read. It, it, it really you know, shows our, our deep passion for this. And so he read the Tao of Twitter three times to, to get in the flow, to get in the mood. And that's, that's how that book came about. But the... the, the, the the Twitter book actually has a very interesting story, and I'm very proud of that book because uh, it, it really has touched thousands and thousands of people from all around the world. And it started out, I was teaching a, a college class, and 
it was always very frustrating for me to talk about Twitter because you could spend three hours talking about Twitter and then people will walk away and they'll forget half of it and they're still frustrated. So I thought, I'm wasting too much time talking about Twitter. So I put together a little handbook. And one day after class, it was toward the end of the semester, and somebody came up to me and said, this little handbook is worth the price of the whole class. <laughs> this little handbook has changed my life. And this person told the story, um, she was a music instructor. And uh, her dream was to play at this folk music festival in Austin, Texas. She said, I followed your advice exactly, and I made these connections in Austin, and I've been invited to this music festival to perform. She said, this is my dream come true. Twitter has opened my world times 10, and I want to thank you for giving me this handbook. I thought, you know what? There is something going on here. This, this little handbook I wrote, uh, it, so, it just solves a problem because the number one question I get asked is, can you help me understand Twitter? I can't do that over coffee. <laughs> so that's why I wrote the book. And so I, I was working with a couple different publishers at the time, and they, none of them were interested in the book. They said, we want a big book. We want a 240-page book so we can get our price point. And I said, that's ridiculous. I'm not writing a big book about Twitter. So I did it my own way. I wrote a little book that you could read in 90 minutes. You could read it on a plane flight and self-published it. And it became the best-selling book on Twitter by far, self-published. So then last year, McGraw-Hill bought the rights to it. And uh, now it's in more distribution outlets. Uh, but it continues. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's never lost steam. It just sells, sells, sells. And, um, and, I, and, the, and the thing I love most about it, Randy, is I get notes and messages and emails from people every day thanking me for writing that book. So it's something that's, it, it, it's, I'm, I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of that little book. Well, you, you, you mentioned um, the, the woman going to the Austin Music Festival and how, it, how you, 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 know, you kind of gave her the ammunition to get her dream uh, uh, to come true. So t step into that just a little bit and talk about the, how a business can use Twitter efficiently. Well, you know, that's a difficult question to answer because every business is different. You really have to start with what's the structure of your industry? Uh, what's the competitive dynamics of your industry? What is your strategy? What is your niche? Now, if you're in a business that's kind of a conversational business, and, you know, the rule of thumb I have for Twitter and business, Randy, is if your business, if you can benefit from going to a face-to-face -face networking meeting, you can benefit from Twitter, generally. That's the rule of thumb I use. So kind of start there. But I mean, as you know, a lot of people use Twitter for, for customer service. I think it's the, it's the best way to build an audience quickly, to build a relevant, engaged audience. It's, it, it's easier than Facebook. It's easier than a blog. It's easier than, than anything because you can go out and follow people even if they don't follow you back and, and look for opportunities to connect to them. And, and kind of force your way into the conversation. And, and I mean, I've made so many amazing connections and relationships. And I mean, you and I first started connecting on Twitter. And That's then right. you started participating in my blog. We kind of got to know each other. And then the best thing of all, we met in real life. That's right. And that's, right the, best, that's the best part of social media. Well, you, let's take that conversation because you kind of hinted at it. It depends on what your business is, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I'm an old, I'm an old school marketer. Been around the, around the horn a little while. You know, you and I are probably in the same age bracket, so we've been around a while. But there's some new people that come in with all this energy, and there's some people that came in with this focus on social. That social is it. There is nothing. Yeah. I mean, everything's going to go away. There's no going. There's not going to be traditional marketing and all that. And mm -hmm. that might that might come to, to to light at some point. But 
what you just said was some businesses fit this this platform, some don't. And I well, mean, and, and yeah. these guys come out there, and it's like you got to be here, you got to be there. And, and yeah. I think the, the the actual business user user or the business that gets pushed there gets disillusioned somewhat because maybe they don't fit it. Well, you know, boy, that's just such a big issue, such a big topic. I would say. 95% of the businesses I work with don't get it. Wow. Uh, and, and this is, and so there's a lot of implications for this. You know, why don't they get it? Do they not understand it? Are they using it incorrectly? Were they sold a bill of goods? I get frustrated with research that, I, that, that shows, you know, 50% or you know, 75, 80% of small businesses say they're not getting any value from social media. They're asking the wrong question. The question should be, do you know what you're doing? Do you even know what you're doing? Let's start there. So, I mean, it, it's not the, these, these, this research that comes out isn't a reflection of the potential of social media, the opportunity of social media. And I'm, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't dictate social media to anybody. One of my customers, I mean, I'm a marketing strategy person. I've been in marketing long before there was Facebook. And what I've really loved is working with companies on their strategy, really getting into the nuts and bolts and the heart of what they're about and what are, you know, how do they uniquely serve their market in a, in a distinctive way? And what is their opportunity? And I, I was working with this company, this telecommunications company, a B2B company. I was working with them for three years before they did anything on social media. And the main reason, Randy, is because they weren't ready. They didn't understand it. The, the people at the top didn't buy in. And every conversation, I'd salt it in a little bit. You know, Every time we met, I'd teach them a little bit something. Then after three years, they came to me and they said, you know, our customers keep asking us why we're not on Twitter. You know this Twitter thing you keep talking about? Maybe it's time we should look at that. That's when the door opens, okay? They weren't ready up until then. Now they're ready and they're in it like crazy. They're doing great. They understand it. But, I mean, look, you know, as business people, if you've been around a while, we've been conditioned for decades to advertise and to broadcast and this 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 is a cataclysmic change it's a cataclysmic change not just in how we do business but in our mindset our mindset toward marketing I mean Jay Bear wrote so beautifully in the, in the utility book and Mitch Joel addresses it in his new book as well that we need to talk about uh, usefulness utility in Jay's terms you know, I talked about it in the in the Twitter book around authentic helpfulness is the core value. That's hard to say instead of sell, 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 I'm going to help, help, help. That's hard to do. It, it makes me nervous sometimes because, I, you know, I grew up in sales. Yeah, you look but at it, but but it really works. You, you look at some some brands, you know, like you say, you get in there, you understand the culture, you understand what their their campaign might be, and you search for a way to integrate and how you can integrate a social campaign or bring that social into an existing campaign. I, that's what what you let. I just see people just jump on there and just start. Ah, this is how you do it, and they bump into the wall a lot and. Sometimes well, that's not know, bad, but it's the part where they get disillusioned is what, what yeah. concerns me. You know, and here, here's the thing. I, I, you know, before we started the, the the broadcast tonight, I challenged you. I was asking you, what, you know, what drives you, what drives you crazy? Let's talk about that tonight. Here's what drives me crazy. Because you're you're touching on a hot hot button here. You know, I I'm working with this big multinational, multi billion dollar company in Miami. <laughs> They fired their last two agencies who created a social media program for them. So they put it out for bid again. Third time. So I bid against two other national agencies. I'm, I'm not, I mean, it's basically me and a few colleagues, you know. I'm not a national agency. So, and they gave me the business because here was my proposal. 
I don't know what you need and neither do you. We're going to start with strategy. We're going to start looking at your company culture and we're going to work from there. The other agencies came in with a cookie cutter, yep. uh, a cookie cutter uh, program. They said, here's how many Facebook posts we're going to give. Here's how many blog posts we're going to do. It's a formulaic plan. Here's your new community manager. Now, this is a multi-billion dollar international company. The person they were proposing as a community manager, her, the extent of her business experience was writing scripts for video games. All right? Now, when I, so I came into this company and I realized their culture, we've got some fixing to do first. All right? Number one, I, I walked around their customer service department and I realized that a lot of people who were angry and that were calling to complain were being put on hold for a long time. I said, are you collecting data about this? They said, no. I said, let's start. We're going to start today. I want to see a Pareto chart of all the, how many people are on hold for three minutes or more. Turns out 6,000 people a month. I said, each one of these people is a potential social media terrorist. You're not ready for social media. Now, here's the thing, Randy. Can you imagine what would have happened if one of these ad agencies came in, opened up a Facebook page, yes, right. opened up a Twitter account, and they're, they're creating 6,000 social media terrorists a month? When they're on hold, what are they going to be doing? Swearing, opinion. <laughs> swearing on your Facebook page. Now, that's what drives me crazy because yeah. the people in our own industry don't get it. Yes. The people in our own industry are trying to make a quick buck and forcing stuff down customers' throats they don't, they don't want, they don't need. They're afraid to not follow the advice because it's the ad agency. And, you know, the ad agency, you know, they just want, they don't understand it themselves. You know, how, you know, how, how, how are they even finding the, the enough people to do it when they're offering this, uh, you know, this, this 23-year-old young lady to be the community manager for this very complicated global business? Yeah, it, it's frustrating. Well, in 2012, you wrote uh, the book Return on Influence, which... Um, it, it was a very well received book again so let's let's kind of go into uh, kind of what you're talking about you know how do you become more influential on the social web how do you how does someone do that well the main, the main the main core idea behind the book is that the way influence and power shows up on the web is vastly different than the way it shows up in real life and that's the problem uh, we see with a lot of people. I mean, they, you know, they say, well, you know, people really don't understand influence. They don't really understand the definition of influence. The problem is they're trying to view it through the lens of what happens in real life. In real life, we acquire power through our title by where we went to school, who we married, how much money we have where we show up on an organizational chart, okay? That's not necessarily influence. Those are check, that's checking boxes. Right. That's jumping hurdles, but that's what we have to do. It's who you know, right? Now, here's the cool thing, Randy. On the web, there is no organizational chart. Nobody gives a crap what your title is. They don't care who you married. They don't care where you went to school. And yet, people undoubtedly are becoming influential on the web. And that's what drove me to figure this out. Uh, what's different now? What's changed now? So, so that's really what the, what the book is about. And, the, and, and so I explore the traditional sources of power and look at how does it show up now? Is it the same? Is it different? And then I go into a new area, which basically is this idea of creating influence and power through our content. Now, this is important to understand. This is important to, to, to grasp now because this is new. This couldn't have happened five years ago. So every business, every brand, every individual 
has an opportunity to grab their share. Influence has been democratized because you don't have to go to Oxford. You, you know, you don't have to marry into a wealthy family. You can create your voice. You can create your audience through the web and find your own power and influence. And that's, I think, what I hope people take from the book is that this is a energizing time. This is an uplifting time that we should all grab this opportunity. What 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 are the realities of um, power and influence on the web? What can what 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 is it open for someone? You know, I think the biggest reality, Randy, is I mean, let's look at let's look at it this way. Let's 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 be very simple about this. Why am I here today? Uh, is it because I teach at Rutgers? Is it because I'm a good father? Uh, is it because I do work in my community? The reason I'm here today is because I blog. You know, I've, I've, I've created a good audience on, on Twitter. I've exerted my power. I've, exert, I've taken advantage of my opportunity. And I've worked really, really hard. But, you know, it's created an opportunity for me that never could have happened five years ago. You and I would never be doing this. Even if Google Plus existed five years ago, you and I would never have this opportunity. You came to know me through my content, and now you are giving me an opportunity to express my ideas, to express my opinions, to make my content ignite. You're helping me do that today. And the only, the only thing, the core, the heart, of that source of influence is content. And so business ne businesses need to understand that, that a legitimate source of power today is content that moves. And most businesses understand the content part. They're saying, well, you know, we need to have a blog. We need to have a Facebook page. But what they don't get is the ignition. They don't understand we need to systematically, continuously build a relevant audience who is interested in us, who will have so, some propensity to move our content and share our content. The content doesn't work unless it ignites, unless it becomes conversational. That's how you create your power and influence. And the research shows, the academic research shows, that people generally don't share content. It's, it's hard to get people to push that tweet button. It's hard to get people to push that Facebook like. They generally don't do it. So you've got to work on the network strategy, not just the content strategy. You need to have a network strategy too. You've got to have them together. Every social media success story, every case study, you can see that. You can see there's a content strategy and there's a network strategy. Um, you, it's, <clears throat> there are very, very rare cases that you can ignite content without a network strategy. You know, one example would be Rebecca Black, the, the teenager who did this, you know, the singing the Friday song a few years ago. She had no network, but it went viral. In business, likely that's not going to happen. So you need to work on the network strategy too. Yeah, uh, I, I'll, I'll just throw a bone your way and tell you that you know there's a lot of good communities out there, mm -hmm. but most pale in in comparison to the growth community that you have developed. And 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 I attribute that to your your engagement after your content is pushed. You have a robust engagement, but you always respond in some kind of way either and you accept challenges, you like to be pushed, and uh, you don't run from it. So, uh, I mean, that's that's one of those eager things that, that and it's always an encouraging type type response to, to anyone to challenge them themselves. So, um, I enjoy that on a daily basis, uh, and, uh, 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 you know, that that's a testament to exactly what you just said. I mean, it's building that audience 
that keep people sitting there going, well, well, what is Mark pushing today? What's what's he what's what's his hot button today or something? You know, what's what's this? <laughs> well, actually, if Mark, Mark's in Ireland, so he must have wrote this last week. Let's see what he wrote last week, and he's pushing today or something. But but it's 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 it is even and and, and even that if you're you know, you are so engaged with your community that if you're, you know, remote, you always come back. Sometimes you can tell when you're remote because it might be a time delay in yeah, response yeah. back, but yeah. you always come back in there. You know, it, I, I, I think that probably is is a key, and, and the funny thing is a number of people have, have remarked to me about that, and they say, Wow, gosh, you know, we're we're amazed that you actually responded to my comment, and it's I just I find that strange because um, you have to, you know, what I encourage people to to do is think back to when you started your blog and you got your first comment, or you know, your first couple people who started reading, and you're like, wow. Oh my gosh! I can't believe it! I can't believe it! They're interested in what I'm doing. They actually took their time to write something to me. That's the most precious gift in the world. How humbling is that, Randy? That I mean, somebody like you. My gosh! You know, you're an experienced marketer. You're running a business. You're working with clients. And you come on and leave a comment on my blog? Are you kidding me? That's amazing to me. I'm humbled every day. It's you know, and of course I'm going to respond because I, I'm. I just think that what an amazing gift that people are giving to me. They're that they're 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 taking a little bit of their time every day, uh, and and a very a very small percentage of people actually. Comment. The rule of thumb is, you know, about two percent of your readers comment. Uh, but the, but but there, you know, I love seeing new faces on there. I love people that are stepping out and leaving a comment for the first time. And I want to encourage them. I want them to know I appreciate it. And I and, and I, I, I I truly do. Um, I love it when I love intellectual challenges. I love thinking ahead. I, that's what pushes me. That's what inspires me is to think, what's new? What's new? What's new? And so I love it when people disagree with me. I, I, try, to, I, I try to be uh, inclusive and respectful. So, I mean, sometimes I probably uh, I'm a little grumpy. I mean, I'm, being, I'm human, right? So, okay. sometimes, you're, sometimes you're grumpy. So I mean I don't necessarily apologize for that. I just hope people understand it <laughs> and will give and will give me a second chance. <laughs> you're, you 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 know and that that's what I, I was on a conversation today and I was talking about the lurkers. You know the people that are silent but they're there. They read your stuff and yeah. they 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 continue the blog post down to get you know to to get more dialogue and exchange between the author and the you know how somebody else interpreted and they read that and at some point in time. They feel compelled to to leave a comment. That's how that that you know they build up the courage to challenge Mark Schaefer or to comment and, and give a congratulatory comment to Mark Schaefer. So you know that's yeah. that's how those work. And I and, and I agree. And I would I, I thought you were going to say let's think back to the just the genuine old timey customer service when somebody comes in and, and exchanges something for you and you say thank you. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's 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 where I, because it's just like I was taught. If your neighbors bring you cookies, you do not give the plate back empty. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Or the shovel dirty. <laughs> or the shovel dirty. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, let's let's go into a, a topic that has certainly been controversial and it deals with influence. The 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 influential uh, uh, programs that are out there. Um, you know the the clouts and the creeds and the people that believe in them and and all that and the the clout this this new uh, endeavor that clout's doing with Bing and, and things like that. Give me give me your take on that right now. Well, I've had a, a really um, great experience the last few years where I've been adopted by this venture capitalist in New York. And he's teaching me about venture capital. He, I don't know why. 
but he just likes me and we're, we've become friends. So he's taken me under his wing. And he is one of the investors. He, he invested in clout. And so if you look at the people, if you look at who is invested in clout, these are the smartest of investors in the world. <laughs> and they've done their due diligence and there's something there. But the, but the most important thing that this VC has taught me is he said, you invest in the person. You've got to see the intelligence. You've got to see the drive. You've got to see the absolute passion of somebody who will never, ever, ever give up. And, I mean, whether you like clout or you hate clout, it doesn't really matter. But, but you've got to admire the CEO, Joe Fernandez, and how he's run that company and turned really nothing. The, the entry barriers to getting into that market are so low. He, and he has turned it really into something distinctive, and he's gotten traction. Um, you know, look, you know, Clout made a lot of uh, mistakes. They made a lot of PR blunders. You know, you can keep rolling old tapes and, you know, be emotional about it. But, I, you know, I, I've just been trained in business to, to look at things from a business perspective, from get through the emotion and look at the business opportunity. What is there? What is there? Now, you mentioned this thing with Microsoft. Microsoft vetted clout for six months. They sent their people in and they, before they made any investment, they investigated clout for six months because number one, they wanted to find out, you know, what, you know, are they creating distinct value? And number two, is this something we could do on our own? At the end of six months, they decided uh, they've got something here. Now, we don't see everything that's behind the scenes. Some of the brands do. You know, we see the mistakes they make. We see that, you know, I've been rated as being influential about aspirin or, or, or <laughs> you know, or ballet, you soon, know. Soon to be motorboating. Yeah, well, that that's going to be the current time. <laughs> that's 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 legitimate. Uh, but so I mean, I just encourage people to 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 take a a dispassionate business view of these tools. And let's face it, I mean, Cloud Cred Peer Index—they basically do the same thing. They really do. So, you know, people that say they love cred and hate clout, that just doesn't make sense. It makes no sense. They're doing the same thing. They're doing the same thing, except clout's doing it, you know, doing more of it. They've got $30 million worth of capital. They've got 10 PhDs working on their algorithms. And so it's, it's a tool, man. It's, 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 it's an indicator. It's a blunt object. But sometimes all you need is a blunt object. A billboard is a blunt object, but billboards have served companies very, very well. Sometimes that's all you need. Sometimes you need a list of people who can move content on sporting equipment. Maybe that's what you need. Is Cloud good for that? Yep, Cloud's good for that. So, uh, you know, to me, it's not controversial. <laughs> if you, if you, it really if, isn't. If, if, <laughs> it just it seems so simple. Yeah, if you take all the all all the missteps out of the equation, right? Yeah. Why do you think there's such such a visceral hatred on one side about that program? But that it, that it and 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 I guess in my mind, it's no one ever wants anybody to have all the apples because if they got the yeah. apples, you know, something like that, it's 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 almost like the kid in the playground. But why do you think that, Mark? Well, I mean, I think you know fundamentally what they're trying to do is is icky. You know, I mean, they're 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 rate they're they're. they're I mean, look, when, when I started looking at this company, I thought this was ridiculous. I was totally offended. I wrote, blog, wrote anti-clout blog posts thinking, how, how dare you try to uh, rate my influence? And the thing that, that strikes at the heart of people, I think, 
is they've got this tagline, uh, the standard for influence. Come on. I mean, they're not the standard for influence. They'll never be the standard for influence. Okay. Now, let's get through that emotion, and let's look at what they're really doing. And then it starts to make sense. But I mean, uh, so I, I, I don't, I, I think it's easy to understand why there's a visceral reaction because it feels like high school. They're, they're rating you in a public way. They're giving you a number that you can compare to other people. And, um, you know, I try to stay centered. I mean, I don't, I don't spend time saying, oh, my gosh, I need to do more Facebook today or my cloud score is going to go down. You know, I, I try to really stay centered. But every once in a while, if my cloud score goes down a point, I, I get a little twinge. You know, <laughs> I get a little twinge. And, and, and I'm, I'm making a mindful attempt at staying centered. I'm too busy to mess around with cloud scores. I mean, my view is I'm going to do my work. And whatever happens, happens. Um, and I think that's what everybody should do. But it's easy to be caught up in this. It's easy to say, wait a minute. I mean, I, believe me, Randy, since I wrote that book, I've met some people who are really out there. You know, <laughs> I'm sure. Who, who, and, and, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Even before I wrote the book, somebody heard I was writing the book and called me and said, I need to know the secret. I need to know how to raise my cloud score. I need it right now. I can't wait until your book comes out. I've got to do this now. I, you know, it's like, you're, really? So, you know, but look, there are, there are extremists in everything. You know, there are, there are extremists in every uh, political party, in every religion, in, in, in there are jerks in companies. Uh, who you know are are extremists, and look, uh, in some way, this might feed people's egos. Okay, fine, you know that's just that's that's human diversity, but I I don't I don't really get caught up in it. I think it, it, it and we were talking in the green room before we went on air, but um, you know pushing the, the, buttons. The, the, the green room. That's what the they call room? it. Mark. That's what they call it. That's where's that's, where's that's where was. There. Where was the shrimp cocktail, my friend? I, I, I gave you a virtual cocktail. <laughs> the, uh, I, I missed the, that. The, they were talking about, we were talking about, you know, pushing buttons, and I, and I shared with you one of the things about the out with the old, in with the new, and the, the you know, this rush to social media is the new everything, and, and, you know, old marketing. You have these conversations with, with some of the people that, you know, they grew up with an iPad in their hand or, or at least a Blackberry or something and they transitioned to, to whatever we have today and they never learned the engagement or, or, or the cultivation of a brand or something like that from the inside out. Uh, but that's what I, I, I kind of attribute the cloud thing to is there was a rush that this cloud, in other words, they never peeled the onion back to look at what is what is this program and what's the benefits of it? It was like all in and then then all of a sudden all the press came up for, for, for some various reasons and everybody says, oh, that's not worth a damn. I, I'm going to go away with that, you know. So, uh, yeah, and that's, no, what, that's what I was saying about <laughs> all these all these so-called marketers go out there and they rush into their local small business and yeah. say, hey, I can fix you up and I can teach you how to sell things. All you need to do is get this Facebook page. And then you hear all this, well, it didn't work for me. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. You know, uh, it, it's funny that this is so naive of me, and I kind of laugh when I think about this. But you know, as I mentioned, I mean, when I when I I started writing the the, the return on influence book, and because I was really um, fascinated by this topic, I was fascinated about you know influence, online influence, and what does it mean, and how does it work. Because I figured if I'm going to spend months and months of my life writing this book, I better really, really love it. And it wasn't very strategic of me because I, I never meant to make a career out of it. I mean, I never meant to be a clout consultant. I never meant to really be influence marketing consultant. I'm, I'm doing some of that, but, uh, you know... It, it, it wasn't very strategic. It's just simply I was interested in it. 
And and as as I read it about when I did the proposal for the for the book, I, I I said I don't know what the conclusion of this book is going to be. I'm going into this totally open-minded. I cannot tell you how this book is going to end or exactly what it's going to say. I have to let the research do its thing. So I started out with with a, with a with a clout with an anti-clout kind of bias. And about halfway through my research, I started saying, wait a minute. There is something going on here. Content matters. What clout does is measure your ability to move content. And you know what? That matters. That matters to a lot of people today, to a lot of businesses today. Are you someone who can move content, a.k.a. create buzz? Can we measure how well you can move content? Can Brian Solis move content better than me? Yes. Should he have a higher cloud score than me? Yes. Now, he may not be more influential in his community. He may not be more influential with you, but he can move content. Can I move content better than some of my students? Yes. Should I have a higher cloud score? Yes. Does it mean I'm more? Can, does it mean I can get people to buy things? Not necessarily, but the ability to create content that moves is a legitimate source of influence. And to the extent that we can measure that, it's an indicator of one little thing. That's a uh, that's a good segue into born to blog content. Sure. Um, do do you? I mean, that is the hottest topic, you know, in the in in the marketing world right now is creating content and blogging is the is the catalyst for that. Uh, do you think that? Um, I mean, we, we we were talking earlier about Twitter and people don't get it. Um, uh, I, I see some people that push the button that says curation is all I need to do and share in other people's content, and they don't create any original. Uh, content at all or very little uh, that gives them any kind of authority voice and so they become just a uh, you know I guess a news broadcaster or something like that so talk about yeah. talk about born to blog a little bit well I mean I think born to blog really is a, a, a natural extension of the return influence book because if content is the engine that really drives marketing today drives power and influence today well then why not write a book about how to do that and when I work with companies on their content marketing strategy, the first thing we look at is what is going to be your source of rich content? Now, you're, you're, you're not really going to get content to ignite just through a Facebook post or just through a tweet. You need to have subst substance to, create, to be helpful. You need to have substance to create a voice of authority over time and usually that comes in one of three forms either a blog a podcast or a video video series now you could there's some other ones out there like maybe Pinterest maybe Instagram if you're in a highly visual business but generally blog podcast video that's where you need to start that fuels that's the engine behind your social media strategy so and, and blogging seems to be most accessible. It's the easiest one uh, for many businesses to get into because they may already have a, a source of existing content they can start to build on. Uh, people are generally, it's easier for them to write than maybe become you know, a radio personality or a podcast or something like that. So Born to Blog was, uh, like I said, it was a very, very towel-like book. Um, and it's also very, um, we're getting lots of great feedback on it, and it's it's also doing very, very well. I've read some of the reviews, and they, they've been stellar. So congratulations mm -hmm. on those three. Um, what's in the hopper for uh, Mark Schaefer? Uh, well, no, let's talk about let's talk about Marketing Companion. I, I, oh, yeah. I am in, I'm entertained by Marketing Companion a lot, Mark. You and Tom <laughs> got something going there. Took you a long time to get in the podcast business. Well, I, you know, I, the, the, the reason I got into blogging was because I needed to learn how to do it. I, you, you can't teach people about marketing or social media if you don't do it. 
so, so you have to do it. Um, so, and that's why I started to, to blog. And I thought, well, you know, I really I need to do some podcasts because I need to learn what it's about. I need to learn how this works. And I, I literally had decided not to do it because I thought um, it would dilute my other efforts. That I, I you know, I, I, I recognize how important that blog is. Uh, I've got some more ideas for, for books in the future, and I didn't want to dilute those efforts. And I was driving back from, from a vacation with my wife, and I said, you know, I've pretty much decided, you know, I'm, I just, I'm not going to do it. The only person I would ever do a podcast with would be Tom Webster. If he was interested in doing it, then that would drive me to, to do it. I mean, Tom and I have been friends for a while. We just really hit it off. We have a great chemistry. Um, I, he has just such a special combination of intelligence and wit. And we have a lot of fun together. And we're thinking about how can we make this more interesting? How can we make this more fun? How do we, how do we have more fun that will, that will shine through? And we, we really genuinely are interested in what we're talking about. We, we genuinely like each other. And we're getting better. You know, so I'm glad that you really like the podcast because it's just going to get better. It's kind of like when you make waffles. You, 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 you throw the first one out. <laughs> For me, it was like the first three. Because it was, well, maybe the first three because it's kind of practice. But it's, 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 it's going gonna, it's gonna to get better, I think. I, I, you know, I think we'll, 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 we'll hit our stride. Yeah, it's a good it's a good thing. I mean, you, your timeline on it is great. The subject matter is always topical, and 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 if if, if uh, there's people listening out there that has not uh, tuned into it, uh, go go to uh, the Mark's Mark's uh, website and you can click on the old old shows. It's great. It's it's fun. Yeah, it's, the marketing it, companion. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, you can subscribe to it on iTunes and on Android, and uh, it's a, it's a lot of fun. And I I, I think. It's just another dimension to creating content. And here's, here's the biggest learning I have so far is that I say things on the podcast I would never say on the blog. Yeah, I've kind of noticed that, Mark. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. What, 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 did I say something that surprised you? No, no. no. Well, no. I'm, I, it, but I, it, it, I guess it's probably not that you wouldn't say on the blog. It's just that your chemistry with Tom, Tom's yeah. chemistry with you, yeah. Makes y'all and it's conversational. It's two men having a conversation about something. Yeah, and it's like y'all, you guys, just like you and I, two guys having a conversation. It comes off that way, so yeah. it's a little bit different. It gives another another level of of, of introspect to, to Mark Schaefer that that the typical person doesn't do. And then you know, it's kind of a point counterpoint with you'll you'll take one side and and Tom might have a different view of it. So it's a good it's a good little debate. I enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, so we're gonna we're our goal is to put one out every other week, and we've kind of got a system going where I mean we we both travel quite a bit, but we're we've got a schedule set up. No matter where we're we are in the world, we you know we're gonna we're gonna figure it out. And uh, yeah, the feedback has been great so far. Uh, we've had a lot of people subscribe to it. Really exceeded my expectations. And it's, 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 it's been a great experience. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, thanks for, for asking about that. Sure, sure. I enjoy that. I look forward to them each time. Well, we're kind of coming to the end. What You, you want to leave us with uh, some hot little topic that's on your mind or, or, or something that, you know? Oh, there's so maybe. many. <laughs> there's, so, there's, there, there's so many. Well, uh, you know, the, the thing that, um, that I've been thinking a lot about lately is – um, this is really the, 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 the topic I'm, I'm toying around with for, um, for a new book is what comes after content marketing. Here's the dirty little secret that nobody wants to talk about is that you don't necessarily have to be good at this. You don't necessarily have to have the best content. You don't necessarily have to have the best product. You need to be first and you need to be overwhelming. Now, if you're second and you have a better product and you have a better content, what do you do? Uh, not easy. Not easy. So, I mean, the first lesson is 
you know, if you haven't really caught the wave, you better get in. <laughs> you better get in. If you don't understand it, you better understand it. Um, now, I think over time that the problem will solve to some extent because right now Google is uh, rewarding volume, volume and consistency, okay? And uh, there are ways to kind of, you know, have some cheats around the social shares and the links and that make provide signals to Google about validation. I think they're going to figure that out over time. I think there is going to be an opportunity for for good quality content to uh, to thrive uh, in the face of someone who's overwhelming. But uh, you know, I gave the example uh, on the on the last podcast uh, called about the content mill about this this person that I saw who was you know I introduced himself as a social media expert and how he created I think it was 63 pieces of content over a, a seven minute uh, video interview with a dentist okay so he, he transcribed it he made it in the blog post he made it in the ebooks he made it into blah 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 okay now is that doing anybody any good? No, but he's first and he's overwhelming and he's owning the Google results in that town for that dental procedure. Um, so, so if, if you're if you're really a better dentist, what do you do? What comes next? What what are your strategies? So that's what I've been thinking a lot about. Is is you know how do you help? businesses that, that, that weren't there first, that didn't understand, uh, but they truly have a great product and service. You know, what, what, what do you do when maybe even advertising isn't an alternative anymore? Exciting times. You want to give a, um, you want to give a plug to the Royal Bangs? <laughs> oh, I'm so proud of the Royal Bangs. Uh, the, Ro the Ro Royal Bangs, that's my, that's my son's band. And uh, he's on a national tour right now. Um, actually, they even played a few dates in Canada. I think they've got a few more coming up. Um, they've toured Europe, I think, four times before. I don't know if anything's planned yet or not, but they have a new album coming out in September. Third album, right? It's their uh, fourth album. Fourth album. Fourth wow. album. And this album is special because it was produced – by Patrick Carney of the Black Keys, which is like one of the probably the, one of the top five chart you know rock bands on the charts these days. They're playing arenas, and uh, so they've kind of uh, adopted my son, and and uh, they're kind of mentoring him. And they produced the last album in Nashville, and so it's it's a it's a great record. And so they're an exciting band. They're a fun band. They're they're really great guys. And if they're coming to a city near you, check them out. Good deal. Well, Mark, I want to thank you uh, uh, for joining joining me tonight. It's been a, a, an immense pleasure. You've shared some great uh, Mark Schaefer insights. It's been uplifting and insightful. Uh, and uh, to all the people that are out there listening, uh, I want to thank you. And uh, we're going to return August 27th with the brand builder and author of Social Media Return on Investment, uh, Olivier Blanchard. Um, so I hope you'll tune in for that. And if you can't, uh, you can always catch three years on our YouTube channel. Uh, and in closing, as I always say, no one knows your brand better than you. Thank you and good night.